Welcome along to St. Peter's this morning. It's fantastic to be here together as God's people. We're going to spend some time in Acts chapter 13. Um, Let me lead us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you haven't left us in darkness, wondering what you are like and not knowing how to respond to you. But we thank you that you have spoken clearly to us through your word. So we pray that you might help us to so hear your word and respond in a way that would bring you glory. Amen. I wonder if you've ever found yourself anxious about catching the wrong train. Maybe you've been to a, a new city, you don't really know your way around the city particularly well, you have a particular place that you need to get to, and you're worried that if you end up on the wrong train, you're going to end up somewhere strange. So when you get to the station, you go up to someone and you say, which train goes to Hoxton Park? And they say, well, I'm almost 100% sure that it's probably that one over there. You turn up to the, um, the, the train and you walk in and you say, which train? Sorry, you say, does this train go to Hoxton Park? A couple of people nod their heads and they say yes. And as you sit down and get comfortable, someone walks in. Hey, are you the guy looking for the train that goes to Hoxton Park? It's not this one. It's that one over there. Well, what are you going to do? What will the people in the train do? A few moments ago, everyone was certain you were heading in the right direction. No one was worried. But now doubts have begun to sunk in. Did I hear that right? Is this not the train that goes to Hoxton Park? Do I need to get up and move? If I stay here, where will I end up? Just as we can find ourselves doubting whether we're going the right way when we travel, sometimes we can have our doubts about the gospel. We can find ourselves in all kinds of situations wondering if the good news about Jesus really does lead to all the places that it promises to. It's not unusual for us to have doubts as we go through life. Are the claims that they make about Jesus really true? Will it really make a difference to my life? Will it make a difference to the way that I live? With society becoming increasingly secular, with our lawmakers often marginalising Christians, with friends and family often treating Jesus as irrelevant, do we sometimes find ourselves thinking, did I miss something along the way? Have I got the wrong train? When my faith can make things awkward amongst friends and family, when it can cause tensions in my workplace, does not doubt start to sink in and I wonder... Is it really worth it? Is it worth the cost? If you've felt any of these doubts before, then Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 13 is going to help us. Verse 14. On the Sabbath, I entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue ruler sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. This is Paul's first ever recorded sermon. He's preaching mostly to Jews in a synagogue. And these are a group of people who have their doubts about the gospel. They're Orthodox Jews who are naturally sceptical of new things. People who are absolutely confident that they're on the right track and they don't need anyone to come along and tell them that things should be different. They probably think that Paul bringing up Jesus in the middle of his sermon is really just a waste of time. And they've got their doubts of whether this could actually be encouraging towards them. But as Paul stands up in this synagogue to speak, he knows that unless they get on board with Jesus, unless he deals with their doubts about him, they'll never be on the right track. So he preaches to deal with their doubts. Um, We're going to work through this part of Acts, and we're going to work through it in a very simple way. We're going to work through verses 16 to 41 where we consider Paul's message. And then we're going to work through verses 42 to 52, where we consider the way that people react to it. Um, Now, I don't know if Paul planned this when he he delivered this sermon, but it breaks nice and neatly into three parts. Uh, In the first part, he speaks about the way Jesus fits in perfectly with Israel's history. In the second part, he focuses on Jesus' death and resurrection. And in the third part, He calls people to respond. Sounds like the perfect sermon. 
So let's, uh, let's get into the history stuff, the way that Jesus is the climax of Israel's salvation history. In verses 16 to 25, as Paul goes through this long history, beginning at the beginning and working through the Old Testament, you'll notice that God is the subject of every verb. Uh, let me just give it to you. God, God chose them. He made them prosper in Egypt. He led them out. He endured their conduct. They were pretty stubborn in the desert. He overthrew the nations around them. He gave them land. And after 450 years, he gave them Saul as a king. And when he didn't work out, he made David their king. God is the subject of every verb. And the point that Paul is making is that God is the one who takes the initiative in saving his people. But what the Jews who doubt really need to hear is that God's initiative doesn't stop with David, but finds its ultimate fulfilment in Jesus. Verse 23, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the saviour Jesus, as he promised. The synagogue may have their suspicions about Jesus. They may think that he's irrelevant. They may say, we've got David and his promises. What can Jesus possibly give us? But Paul is pointing out that Jesus is not irrelevant. But he's the one that the Old Testament is pointing to. For them to embrace Jesus is not to turn away from the promises of God, but to experience them in all their fullness. So having introduced the Lord Jesus, who's consistent with their history, he then turns to the the two big moments that change everything, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 26. Brothers, children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every day. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Why does Paul say these words in the way that he says them? Well, he's doing what we call today apologetics. He is defending the faith against the objections that people will raise against it. Uh, The Jews are probably sitting there and they're thinking, uh, this Jesus guy, if, if he's going to be everything that Paul says that he is, then why did the leaders in Jerusalem reject him? If he really is our saviour, like Paul thinks that he is, then why did he die on a cross? Everyone knows that crosses are just for criminals. And so Paul defends these objections, and time and time again in those verses, he says, go back to the scriptures and read them. Because when you read the Old Testament scriptures, you'll see that the saviour, the Messiah, would suffer and be rejected and die. It's interesting that Paul doesn't um, actually uh, quote um, Isaiah 53 or something like that. We might expect him to. Um, Maybe Luke, as he he shortened the sermon down to fit in the book of Acts, didn't want to spend the ink ink on quoting the Old Testament. But it could be that he actually didn't quote the Old Testament because there's an even more convincing proof that's also backed up by the Scriptures that will prove his point. Verse 30. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you good news. What God promised to our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Jesus up. When I was a boy and someone at school made some amazing boast about some superhero talent that they had, Um, We could never imagine small boys doing things like that. The answer was always the same. Prove it. Prove that you can do that. And it usually settled it because you couldn't prove that you could do these amazing things that you boasted about. The resurrection is the moment where God proves it, where he proves that Jesus really is everything that the Old Testament says about him, where he proves that he really can deliver us from sin and death. Paul preaches on Psalm 16 and and he reminds us that every generation has lived under the shadow of death. 
and every generation has tried to break free from it. But no one's been able to do it. Even today, with all the modern medicine we have, no one has got a vaccine for death. Our surgeons, they're pretty good at cutting people up and putting them back together. But I don't know any surgeon that knows how to remove the shadow of death. But on the third day, God raised him from the dead and Jesus broke free from the shadow that has stuck to us for all human history. You might say that when Jesus rose from the dead, he overshadowed death. And if he can overshadow death, then there can be no doubt about who he is. Paul is saying to these Jews that are doubting, doesn't the resurrection of Jesus prove that he really is the saviour? So don't doubt, but turn to him. And we need to do the same, don't we, when doubts about the gospel crop up in our mind and we wonder if it really is true. We wonder if it really can change things. We turn to the resurrection of Jesus and we remember that that is where he proves it. Well, every good sermon I've been told calls people to respond and, and Paul preaches here a very good sermon calling people to respond because this is a matter of life and death. Verse 38. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Paul says there are two trains at the station and you need to make a choice between them. One train leads to life and the other train leads to destruction. If you get on board with Jesus, you will be forgiven because he justifies everyone who pins their hopes on him. He pays the penalty for our sins so that he might declare us righteous before God and the law could never do that. You see, the law is very good at pointing out how far short we fall. It exposes our guilt. It can't make us righteous. But Jesus dying in our place and raising from the dead declares us righteous in the sight of God. He justifies us. He's the train that we need to be on. But Paul very simply says that those who scoff at him perish. He's asking the question, which train are you on? Do you need to make a change? And they're not bad questions for us to consider. Which train are you on? Are you on the one with Jesus that leads to life? Or are you on the one that leads to death? So Paul here, he's preaching to doubting Jews. He's trying to convince them that their doubts are unfounded. That Jesus is entirely consistent with their salvation history that his resurrection proves that he really is the saviour and that they need to respond to him. How are they going to react to this message? Verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Pretty amazing, the whole city come out. uh, And you know what they come out to hear? The word of the Lord. Four times in the next ten verses, Paul will speak, sorry, Luke will speak about the word of the Lord. And there's a connection there between the sermon that, that Paul preached last week and the word of the Lord. He's saying that the message about Jesus, the promised one, the one who died and rose again, the one who justifies those who believe, that message is the word of the Lord. The Old Testament was often called the word of the Lord. And here Luke actually says that the preaching about Jesus, the gospel, is on equal footing as the Old Testament scriptures. It's God's authoritative truth, which means that it will always be true. The doubts that people have about Jesus do not make him less true. 
nor does a wholesale acceptance of him make him even more true. It's true because this is how God has acted in his son for the salvation of the world. Whether people accept it or reject it, whether it's popular or scorned, it will never cease to be the word of the Lord. And we need to keep that in mind. Verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Well, this reaction isn't so good. They reject the gospel for one very simple reason. It threatens their agenda. They're used to being the religious establishment in town, the the go-to people for faith. But what Paul is teaching is undermining their position. As people are being drawn closer to Jesus, they're being drawn away from the synagogue and they're feeling threatened. So what do you do when you feel threatened? You attack. And they attack Paul, not because it's not true, but because it threatens what they love. It makes me wonder if anything has really changed in the last 2,000 years. How many times do you find someone rejecting the good news about Jesus? Not because they don't believe it, but because it challenges their way of living. It undermines their freedom. It, It upsets their way of life. So they poke holes in it. Because if they were to accept it, it would mean that they'd need to change trains. And we see it at a political level all the time as government tries to make legislation and the gospel kind of rubs against it the wrong way. We see our leaders discrediting the gospel and casting doubts over it, labelling it as being no longer relevant, outdated, toxic, out of touch with the real world. And it would be very easy for us in moments like that to begin to have our doubts, to begin to wonder, maybe what they're saying is true. Maybe I am on the wrong train. Maybe I need to move with society. Maybe I've just been stuck in this position for too long. But we need to remember, other people's agendas will never stop the message about Jesus from being true. They were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against Paul and what he was saying. Oh, we might think that this would actually derail the gospel if the theologians of the day will not accept what Paul is saying and instead try to contradict it. Then maybe the Gentiles will go, wait a minute. If they won't accept it, then why should we? They're the ones who know about this. But God remains sovereign over salvation. And what we see is this salvation goes to the ends of the earth. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord and all who were appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. When people pick on what we believe, uh, what do we do? I think the natural tendency is to want to just keep quiet and not bring it up. But actually, that's not the way to go. Because God is sovereign over salvation God who is sovereign over the history of Israel, God who is sovereign to send his son into the world, is the God who is sovereign over the salvation of you and I and everyone in our world. And he sent his message about Jesus all across the world so that it may penetrate hearts and people may believe in him. So whenever we find opposition to the gospel, we don't keep quiet about it, but we keep speaking, trusting in the sovereignty of God. Well, let me try and uh, land uh, this sermon. Uh, Paul landed his very well. I wonder if I can do the same thing. How can we pull together some of these threads? Let me ask you the question, what do you do when you have doubts about the gospel? Well, let's go back to that illustration at the start about the train. There you are sitting on the train. You're very confident that you're going to the right place. And then someone comes in and throws all of that into question. Doubts begin to swirl around in your mind and you're picturing yourself 
ending up in some strange place that you don't want to be, what are you going to do? Well, in that moment, there's a question that you should be asking yourself, a really important question. Who am I going to listen to? Do you always take advice from random strangers? What if they're wrong? Would it be different if the person who walked in was wearing a CityLink uniform? Or would it be different again if it wasn't someone that walked in but it was a voice that came over the intercom from the train driver? Well, I imagine if that was to happen, then there wouldn't be any reason to doubt at all. You'd be absolutely certain about what you need to do. Who do you listen to when doubts about the gospel begin to surface in your life? When you begin to wonder if the claims about Jesus are true? When you're anxious about whether serving him will really be better for your life? When it feels like it's going to leave you unpopular and you wonder if that's good for you? When people that you love and trust, people who haven't left their brain at the door, start criticising what you believe and poking holes in it, and throwing around the kind of labels that make you squirm, what do you do then? Well, you need to do exactly what you did on the train. You ask yourself the question, who am I going to listen to? Will I listen to my fears? Will I let my insecurities drive me? Will I let the unqualified opinions of others undermine what I believe? Or will I be someone who listens to the word of the Lord? Will I be someone who understands that the message about Jesus, the one who perfectly fulfills the Old Testament, the one who overshadows death, the one who justifies those who believe, the word of the Lord will never lead me astray, but will always guide me to what is right. You see, you can have great confidence in the word of the Lord because God is no liar. It may not make you the most popular person in the room. It may not give you the easiest life. You can see that from what Paul had to put up with. But if you pin your hopes on Jesus, you'll never be on the wrong track. You'll never be on the wrong train. So when doubts surface, return again to the word of the Lord. Return again to the gospel of the Lord Jesus and let him put them to rest. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege it has been to consider this part of your word. Uh, we pray that as we listen to this next song, uh, that you might help us to reflect upon our lives and that you would help us to find deep confidence in the love of Jesus. Amen.